Hey everybody, Professor Gassimi here, and in this component of the lecture, we're gonna speak about how the web works. Well, what is the web? We just got done speaking about the internet, and colloquially, we oftentimes use the internet and the web interchangeably. But in reality, the internet and the web are two distinct things. The web is not the internet, it's an application that's built on top of the internet. Okay, and the web specifically refers to the set of public documents that are distributed by machines through the internet. Okay, this is your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript, your YouTube videos, all those things. Those are what are the World Wide Web, whereas the infrastructure that sits underneath it is what we refer to as the internet. Now, when you're thinking about the web, the nomenclature you're going to hear a lot is servers and clients. There's this distinction that's made between these two kinds of machines. Now, a client are the typical web user's internet connected devices. So this is somebody who's got a laptop or a mobile phone and they want to visit youtube.com and they type that into their browser and make a request for some content from a server which is responsible for storing a copy of the web pages, the sites, the videos, the apps, whatever it is, and basically choosing if some circumstances are appropriate to send a copy of that back to the client for them to view on their personal device. There are four technologies that make the web possible. Uh, the first one is obviously your internet connection. You know, you need uh, those cables that we mentioned in the earlier component of the lecture to that connect the machines if you want to uh, send a document from one to the other. And you also need the, the transmission control protocol. These are the rules that the internet uses so that um, when you send information across the cables, they don't get corrupted, they arrive at the right place, and so on and so forth. Okay, but you need two additional things on top of that. The first one is you need a service if you want an end user to conveniently have access to uh, your content and you don't want them to just memorize an IP address. You need some service that's going to map those IP addresses to things that are a little easier to remember. So you want to map 192.168.3.49, for example, to, I don't know, google.com, so that when people type in Google, they can get to the right IP address without having to remember these horrible um, uh, IP addresses. And the second thing you need is some kind of a protocol that defines how, what's the decorum for when you want to request information from another machine and when you want to receive it. Note that this is distinct from the problem of just connecting the machines, right? Connecting the machines and making sure data arrives from one to the other is not the same as what's the formality for how we go about performing the exchange, right? It's like the distinction between being able to uh, speak a language versus the etiquette of language. That's the difference between a TCP uh, versus uh, HTTP, that subtle distinction between the ability to speak itself versus the etiquette of how to speak. OK, so when you talk about um, clients and servers, uh, it's important to note that a there are certain things that make a server a web server. And some of those things um, have to do with the hardware. But oftentimes, uh, it more specifically has to do with the software that's on that machine. So the, from a hardware perspective, uh, in order for a, a computer to, to serve information, it has to have a disk somewhere where it's storing it, right? It needs uh, a place to store its HTML documents, images, CSS style sheets, JavaScript files. It needs RAM so that it can, when it receives a request, it can process that and send information back. But then additionally, and this is um, unique to things uh, that are web servers, it needs software that's going to understand web addresses or URLs, which we're going to speak about in a minute, and understands that protocol, right? The nuances of how requests are made so that it can unpack that request, understand what's being asked for, and send the corresponding file back to the client. Okay. So how exactly is this information exchanged? Well, uh, I think this diagram on the right-hand side does a pretty good job illustrating it. So let's say that you're this machine number one, 
and you're very interested in getting access to some content on laurapulse.com, well, one thing you might do is um, you don't know what laurapulse.com's IP address is. So the first thing you would do is when you actually request laurapulse.com is your uh, computer takes care of this process of actually going to something called a DNS server or a domain name server that's a record keeping system that says, well, actually, laurapulse.com is this IP address and it sends that information back to your machine. Your machine then says, aha, okay, great. So I know where the IP address is and I know what kind of content I want from laurapulse.com. So I'm gonna package that up into an HTTP request. I'm gonna send that over to laurapulse.com and Laura, uh, you know, using TCP IP, right? That fundamental communication protocol that lies at the bottom. But the way that I'm gonna send an HTTP request over TCP IP. Okay, and then laurapulse.com is gonna receive it and she's gonna say, um, yeah, this checks out. I like this, I'm happy to, to give you what you're asking for or no, I refuse you because I think you're a spammer or a bot or something like that. And then we'll respond back to your machine with, assuming they accept it, uh, a series of small chunks called packets, which are then reassembled and displayed by your browser. Now that whole process is taken care of behind the scenes when you type in larapulse.com or google.com or wikipedia.org or whatever. This process is what's happening behind the scenes. And it, that process is what's used to exchange really two major kinds of information. The first are the code files. So this is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those are sent from server to client, and then the browsers render them into user interfaces that you can interact with. And then there are assets. These are everything else that's not the code, the images, the music, the videos, the documents, and so on. So once the information gets sent from the server back to your client, the way that your browser or what your browser does with that next is it first parses the files. So it grabs the HTML file that gets sent back. And we're going to talk about this specific structure of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in the coming two weeks. So, so don't worry if a lot of this, you don't know it yet. But at the high level, it grabs those HTML documents, such as the one I'm showing on the right, and it looks for any dependencies specified in those HTML documents. Those are specified by link and script tags. If there are some dependencies in your HTML document, it runs back to the server and says, well, hey, uh, in addition to this HTML file, you know what else I need? I need these two or three other files. In the case of the example on the right, uh, I need main.css because that's what's contained in this link. So it runs back and makes another HTTP request and it says, give me that file. Okay, it then compiles that code through the browser, okay, to create um, the visual representation that you just seamlessly uh, explore and enjoy. So the main things I want you to take away from this component of the lecture are that the World Wide Web is a system of public web pages accessible through the internet. It is not the same as the internet. Computers connected to the web are called clients and servers, depending on the role that they're playing in the information exchange process. The term web server can refer to both hardware or software, or both of them working together. Um, clients find IP addresses through DNS servers, which make requests via HTTP and transmit via TCP IP. And finally, code files and assets are combined by your browser for your viewing pleasure.